I'm digging the new firmware 3.0 for Nikon's flagship Z9. I'm gonna show you some of my favorite new features and how to use them. Well, hey everyone, Hudson here. Welcome to this week's video. Uh, I've got a list of things that I find great about Nikon's new firmware 3.0 for the Z9. Uh, and I've, you know, I'm gonna talk about some things to do with video shooting at, towards the end of this video, things to do with the photography side of the Z9's firmware right up front. I know there's been a little bit of controversy with this firmware update with the way that it affects 3D autofocus tracking and particularly the hybrid handoff method that I and other uh, photographers have advocated using for, for capturing and tracking erratic, fast-moving subjects or picking one subject out of a crowd of potential subjects. And I did a video on Tuesday with lots of examples, lots of recordings of the back screen as I'm working with the camera to show what I'm talking about and some methods um, that, that talk about why I don't find this firmware to be anything but an improvement. And you can check out that video if you haven't seen it already. There's a link here to just click on and check that out. I'm gonna run through and, and go through this list and I'm also gonna divide this video into chapters with linkable time codes. If you go into this video's full description by clicking on the title or show more, you can go in there and there's a table of contents and you can just click each individual time code to watch the section that's most interesting to you or rewatch it if you want to. There's also links in there. All right, let's just dive in, let's go after it. So firmware 3.0, the, the photo side, a um, couple of my favorite things are just the improved 3D tracking. I find it stickier. I think they're utilizing a little auto area autofocus in the secret sauce. I think that once it has a, a, a tracking subject automatically detected in that 3D, whether it's a human face or eyes or torso or an animal face, eyes, body, or a vehicle, once it sees that subject, has it locked and detected, if it loses it for a second in transition, whether it goes behind something, looks away, whatever it is, it's using a little bit of auto area autofocus. You'll see some little squares pop up and zip around near the point looking to reacquire it. Um, and, and that's thrown a few people off, maybe people who weren't used to using auto area autofocus in the earlier Z cameras, the Z6, the Z7, Z50, Z5, Z30, ZFC version twos of the Z6 and Z7. I think most of us have seen those little squares running around really quite accurately in most situations for auto area autofocus. It creates a little controversy, I think, for some people who might have been misusing the hybrid handoff method from wide area autofocus into 3D tracking for capturing erratic fast moving subjects. I think if, if you were potentially trying to hand that off before seeing an automatically detected subject like eyes or a face, well, then it's acting a little bit differently and going into frame-wide uh, auto area detection. Watch that video again, the video that I did on Tuesday, just about all of this to learn more about it. My, my takeaway from using the camera a lot over this, over this last several days since this firmware launched is that the auto area modes, whether they're in you know, wide area or 3D tracking, are stickier, they're working better, they're keeping subjects better. It's it's just quite, quite good. I'm blown away that they've even gotten an extra half a stop of low light uh, autofocus detection and more accuracy for low light autofocus because after running workshops with people shooting other brands of camera, other really popular brands of camera, and they've seen how good the Z9 is at low light autofocus and with its starlight mode and warm color mode working at night, I've seen people sell complete collections of bodies and lenses and move over to Nikon if they like night shooting because it's low light autofocus was already so mind bending and accurate. So I haven't been able to go out and test that, but if they say it's gotten even better, it's hard to believe because it was so good to begin with. It's exciting that it's potentially even better yet. Uh, they're saying that it has some flash shooting uh, enhancements that give you even better control and oversight of what the background exposure is as compared to the flash exposure. That's cool for anybody who does a lot of flash lit artificial lighting scenes. Um, not something I use a ton of, but it'll be interesting to explore the next time I do a portrait shoot with flash. Uh, one thing that's really, really cool, and I think the last big thing with regard to the photography side of the house, 
is the new 60 frame per second high speed JPEG capture mode. And that mode enables you to use that pre-release, post-release capture setting where you jump in and you say, I, I, if I'm holding down my shutter halfway, waiting for something to happen, like a baseball to come off a bat, or like I used this mode at its 30 frame per second full res JPEG mode in Costa Rica, there was a moment where some of my workshop students were capturing images of this really small snake that was wrapped around a tree. It was a non-poisonous snake. So our, guide, our guides had told us it's completely safe to get up close and photograph it. So we we're doing some macro photographs of this small snake. And every now and then it would roll its tongue out. And some of my students were capturing that tongue. In fact, the best image I think of the day was Gary Sharlock's image, which he captured with the Z7. Um, I didn't have a lot of time. They were standing around it, you know, waiting for that tongue to come out, trying to nail it. And I thought, well, this is the perfect opportunity to use my pre-roll capture with the Z9. So I turned on the pre-roll capture, told it to capture a half a second before I hit the shutter button and a second after I hit the shutter button and just waited for the tongue to come out. I hit the shutter. It, I was holding the shutter halfway down. When the tongue came out, I depressed it. Well, it's been recording images just over themselves on the memory card. The minute you depress the shutter, it saves the images at 30 frames a second the 15 seconds or the 15 frames before you press the shutter along with everything while the shutter's pressed along with a second of frames after you let off the shutter. So somewhere in that burst, you're gonna get the tongue coming out. I don't think my image is as great as Gary's image of the snake's tongue coming out, but I got it quicker. I guarantee that. I got it the first time that the tongue came out because of that pre-roll burst mode. It's just a cool kind of thing that you can use in certain situations. It would be neat if it did it with raw files, but you know, prior to firmware 3.0, you had 30 frames a second at full resolution or 120 frames a second at something like six megapixels. So adding a 60 frame per second at 19 megapixels is a really usable, even faster frame rate for things that are moving really, really quickly. The bullet going through the watermelon, you know, those kinds of water droplet type photography. Cool stuff. All right. So let's jump over to video, and I actually think video has one of the cool... Oh, you know, one thing I'll tell you before, before you jump in and do that. That pre-roll burst thing got me thinking about the top dial on the Z9 and, and how you interact with changing frame rates and modes from, you know, from going to the... Um, from single frame to high speed continuous, low speed continuous, uh, and, and, and um, timer mode, all the way into that multiple, the drive mode switch, which activates the drive mode button on the top. Since I've started messing around with that, I just leave it on this drive mode switch because what happens with the drive mode switch is you can hit that button and use your control wheels to control whether you're in low speed, you're in single frame, high speed low, uh, high speed high, and you can control what the frame rate of high speed low and high speed high are with the sub dial, the front dial with your, with your index finger. So the back dial can change you from high speed continuous low at whatever rate you want that to be to high speed continuous high, whatever rate you want that to be to timer mode with how many seconds you want the timer mode to be with that sub selector dial, and then into those high speed JPEG modes, and you know, I think it's a good idea to throw your um, your pre-release capture options into your My Menu. That's setting uh, setting D4 it goes in, and you can go determine what your pre-release burst or post-release bursts would be uh, in order to capture before you press the shutter and after you release the shutter. Pretty uh, pretty cool stuff. So. Let's go into the video side, and, and really, uh, you know, firmware 2.0 brought a lot of video enhancements like 8K, 60 frame per second Nikon RAW capture, which is just crazy, ProRes in 8K, you know, some stuff that I couldn't really picture myself doing. I'm not making, you know, the new version of IMAX movies here. But now with firmware 3.0, they've done something really, really cool. For those who like to shoot a little bit of video, they put this high-res zoom in. And it's hard for me to fathom how the camera is doing this. You know, back in the old days when I started shooting video, you know, I think I was using the, the, the Nikon, um, I think I was using my, my D500 first and the D850, 
And I mostly shot in 1080 for the early YouTube stuff that I did with DSLRs. It's embarrassing to look at now. But, uh, you know, it, there was a lot of limitation about how it was processing the information off the sensor. And at that time, my good friend Andy Atkins was shooting with Panasonic's, I think, GH2 or GH3. And it had a mode where it would crop to the center 1080 of the sensor. And if you were shooting with a longer lens, it would crop in and let's say, you know, it would, it would double because it was like a 4K sensor in that camera and it would crop into just the center 1080 lines of resolution and it would give you a true 1080 uh, video capture just off the center of the sensor and that would be the same as sort of using an APS-C crop sensor on a full frame lens it would crop in on the lens's projection and it would make a 200 millimeter lens look like a 400 millimeter lens in full 1080p well what Nikon's doing is that same thing with an 8k sensor down to 4k all right, so when you normally are shooting video in this camera with in, in FX mode, in full frame mode, it's down sampling that 8K sensor resolution into 4K sensor wide. So it's taking some pixels, sampling them, and taking an 8K image of each frame, down resing each frame to 4K, compressing it into a video. Kind of amazing. What they've added is not only the ability to crop down to the center 4K, like that Panasonic and my friend Andy's long ago, they've added the ability to just slowly zoom by cropping in on the sensor without zooming the lens at all. In fact, I can throw my, my beloved uh, last F-mount big lens that I've got, the 105 1.4 old F-mount lens, the, the fabled lens of old, which has no vibration reduction, but it gets in-body image stabilization from the Z9. I can flip it on, flip into video mode, and now using function one or function two, uh, function one button to zoom in, function two button to zoom out, I can frame up, zoom in, manually focus so that I got peeking on the little Nikon logo here, zoom back out so I see the whole frame, hit that button and just zoom myself in on that little Z30, which I'm working on a review of right now, sitting to the side of me smooth and easy and it gives you three different zoom speeds which is there's one funny thing about this function you know it, i read about it i thought wow that's exciting i remapped it in video mode to my function one function two button in every one of my shooting menu banks and then i went to use it and it wouldn't work and it wouldn't work and it wouldn't work well i hadn't done a deep enough dive and i realized that if you go into the menu and you go into the um it's in the video recording menu and you have to scroll all the way down or you know go up to the from the top scroll backwards up to the last option is turning high res zoom on and off so there's an on off switch to this thing i have no idea why but it's there uh and then in a completely separate menu <laughs> i don't know why they're not together you have to go into your custom settings under the g section for video and down now under uh, G8, you've got high res zoom speed. I don't know why those aren't together. It seems like either they should both be in the custom settings video menu or they should both be in the video menu. At any rate, I leave it turned on and once again, I put that control, that G8 control in my menu where it's easily accessible. And you can go in and choose whether you want that zoom to be slow and super cinematic, you know, it's a dramatic effect as it slowly zooms in. Or the standard zoom, which I think looks pretty good. I think that's probably the, a good default. Nikon did a good job choosing the, the standard speed. Or you can have it zoom in really fast. You know, one of the killer side benefits of this we haven't even discussed that I just showed is I manually focus the Nikon logo in that frame. I get in-body image stabilization with even this beautiful old 1.4, 105. And then as it zooms in, it's not changing focus whatsoever. You know, if you've ever used a zoom lens and tried to do this in video, it, it's nearly impossible without a motor drive zoom to do it smoothly. You know, it's a, it's a practice that videographers actually get controllers to, to, to turn their zoom rings for them with a, with a big easily to control dial or they use a motor. Uh, just to do it smoothly for the Hollywood type cinematic zooms. This is pretty darn cool. Um, it just adds a little bit to that repertoire. And you can program it so that it's on that function one, function two button like I like, so that your middle finger and your, and your ring finger of the right hand are right over it just when you're you know, 
in holding on to the grip of the camera. If you're working on a tripod and you don't want your hand around the camera, you can put it on the back uh, subselector, that, that sort of D-pad around the OK button. Um, you can also put it on the, the function ring of an S lens. So those are all, all options. They also gave some new methods for time code syncing that are even more powerful for people that are, say, shooting a Hollywood movie with multiple cameras just to sync all the time codes so that it's really easy to blend footage when you're working in a multicam setup. Not something most of us are gonna use, but I'm sure it's awesome for, for the filmmakers out there working with multiple cameras. And, and they've got a new uh, LED banding aid that helps with shooting videos under LED lights, which get that kind of flicker sometimes. And they've got this new real fine tunable, uh, real high, fine resolution control to just tune in the, um, the way that the camera is shooting to avoid that sort of flicker that's going on with certain kinds of lights. So all in all, you know, to me, the big news on the video side is that crazy zoom. I wonder how they're processing the data to be able to just differentially be, be interpolating smaller and smaller sections of the sensor smoothly as it zooms in and out and save all that data. That's a tremendous amount of processing, but it works really well and it's a cool feature. I think the autofocus improvements are definitely, if, if you're a person who likes to track moving automatically detected subjects with this camera, whether in 3D tracking or in wide area, or if you're properly handing off via hybrid handoff mode from wide area to 3D tracking, the improvements with the way that it sticks with the subject that you've acquired are, are definitely noticeable. I mean, it's already been great. It's even that little bit better. I think that the 60 frame per second uh, high-speed JPEG burst mode with the ability to do pre-roll and post roll is pretty, pretty cool. So again, next week, I'm gonna be releasing an updated walkthrough of my menu structure, how I've tweaked it from my original setups. You know, I did the setup videos for the Bank A, Bank B, Bank C, Bank D, where Bank A was a complete walk through the Z9's videos, or the Z9's menus. It's quite a long video that goes in a lot of detail. This new one will be shorter. It's gonna be a quick walk through how I've changed settings after a year of shooting with this camera from Costa Rica to the Tetons, to the Cascades, to Mexico. Um, so it's gonna basically walk through, and as I said, it's gonna have a little tutorial on how to go from your standard knock around shooting mode instantly into a high speed capture mode to track birds in flight at a high frame rate at a fast shutter speed with just a button press. Uh, it's also gonna talk about how to set up that new sort of hybrid handoff mode that lets you access wide area, 3D tracking, single point, or for some people dynamic, depending on which one you prefer, as well as manual focus and get everything into a true back button design without using the shutter at all in that process so that you can also use manual focus and, and not have it tweaked at all when you touch the shutter. It gives you all the power of back button focusing with all of those modes accessible. So. Cool stuff, uh, quick announcements. You know, if you've enjoyed this video, thanks so much for watching. You know, I, I hope you'll consider clicking like and subscribe, sharing it with your friends. That helps out tremendously. Um, I'm gonna put links to all of those setup videos that I originally did for the Z9 in this video's description. Again, if you click the title or show more, you can jump in and see that. We're holding office hours on November 15th. That's a big free get together meeting on Zoom and YouTube Live. Uh, where we have a live discussion Q&A. We're gonna talk about gear, about whether you really need new gear or whether the gear that you have is good enough. In those cases where you do need new gear, how do you get rid of your old gear in a, in a safe and reliable way um, that gets you the most money possible out of it? And how do you find new gear when there's so much supply chain disruption and back order status and that kind of stuff. So we'll take Q&A, we'll talk, and we'll, we'll all pick each other's brains about that live. You can sign up at hudsonhenry.com slash office hours and you can leave us a question when you sign up. All right, uh, we're also releasing workshops. Uh, Cuba's up and live, it's basically, there's one slot remaining in the two workshops, so at this moment. So if you're interested in that, I would jump over there, but keep checking at hudsonhenry.com slash workshops. We are adding 2023 20, workshops. Uh, there's gonna be some great ones and we're adding them, so keep an eye out there. And you can also sign up to be pre-notified before we list it live to the public. We've been selling those out as fast as we list them, so good idea to get pre-notification. 
All right, everybody, so that's it for now. Look forward to next week. I'm gonna do a video about autofocusing, some new ways of doing it with the Z9, uh, and also releasing that full new addendum setup video. All right, everybody, stay safe. I hope you're staying creative. We'll see you next week.